we've got a great panel here for you today. Um, we, we, have, uh, we have three different types of insurance companies. We have, uh, a, a, we have representatives from the nonprofit side of the insurance market. We have a for-profit uh, insurer, and we have Oscar, which is a, a very interesting new entrant into the insurance market, trying to take advantage of some of the things that are going on in, in the data world. And we have David Goldhill, who, in my view, is the most compelling writer today on the topic of uh, consumer-driven healthcare, and also happens to be CEO of the Game Show Network. So he, he's, he's managed to, to, to achieve at a high level in two different areas. Uh, and I, I thought this morning that, that Steve Forbes set the table for today in, in a very important way in that he, he alluded to the fact that there, one of the trends that people haven't been appreciating about health insurance and the way health insurance is evolving is that consumers are seeing more and more of the costs directly. They're paying more of the premiums if they're an employer-sponsored insurance. Uh, they're seeing more of the co-pays. The deductibles are higher. They're, seeing, they're doing more with HSAs. And of course, the ACA uh, is also accelerating that trend by creating these exchanges where people shop for their own for their own health insurance. So I'm, I'm interested uh, in, in your thoughts, and maybe start with Dave, how you think this is, is, do consumers have the tools to actually shop for care? Because that's what they're being asked to do now. So not yet. Um, I think it's a matter of, uh, of critical mass. But I think we can see critical mass coming. Uh, in my own company, three quarters of employees are on high deductible plans. Uh, Two thirds of employers say they may switch to high deductible plans only if necessary to avoid the Cadillac tax uh, when it comes on later this decade. Uh, we think there's 20 million now uh, employed persons whose families have high deductibles. Here's what I think is interesting. Once you start to get to a number like 40 and 50, and once you see these high deductibles be much higher than we'd previously thought, you know, it used to be anything over 1,000 was a high deductible. We now regularly see people with three, four families with 5,000 and above. What it means for them is, in any given year, they're going to wind up paying all of their health care out of pocket, with the exception of some of the preventative care services that are deductible free. That's a sea change. Right? If the average employed person every year pays all of their health care out of pocket until they get very sick, two things change. One, the way they think of their insurance plan changes. And the second, which I think we've seen none of yet, but we will see a lot of, the way providers have to address those people changes. That, that's the real chance for transformation. I think it takes critical mass, but I think we're probably only a couple years away from that. You guys want to pipe in on that? Well, I, I would just like to say, Ovik, that one thing the Affordable Care Act has done is it's created an environment where a, a small segment of the, of the population can go and shop as consumers, if they have the ability to do it, if they choose to do it. We, for example, Independence Blue Cross and our Amar Health affiliates, we have, uh, we're on two exchanges, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. We offer 13 products and 40 variations of those products, different price points, different co-pays, different networks. So uh, as, as consumers become more educated in that space, uh, it, it, will be, it, it will be good for them to, to shop and have comp competitive uh, choices. On the, on the really group side, we found that uh, the, the educated consumer, the, the benefit executive, is looking for product structures that, that give them the flexibility to, to give their employees some responsibility of, of really taking hold, taking care of, of themselves and paying attention to their own health. So consumerism is coming on one end of the spectrum in these individual consumers who are buying on the exchange and then large, large corporations where benefit leaders are pushing it in that direction. Kevin, your company has been uh, really uh, at the forefront of trying to see if there are new ways to engage the consumer. You've got this new product that started out in New York and now you're expanding New Jersey. How's that going and what are you learning about how consumers are interacting with this new ability to shop for coverage and the new responsibility they have to, to pay for healthcare directly? I'd say a couple of things. One, I think it presents, and we only serve individuals today, I think that it presents an opportunity for us, and I think that the consumers want it um, and expect it. From the opportunity side, I think the opportunity for us is to empower the consumer with a customized usability layer, because the complexity of the delivery system is not going to go away, yet now you have these consumers who, whether it's from group business or individual side, are coming in, and now they've got to navigate a world where 
if they engage in their past behavior of entering the door that's closest to them, there'll be direct financial consequences for it. And they're stuck, and they want to know um, what to do. And I think it presents a real opportunity for us as an industry to provide that usability layer, and people want it. What we're seeing in our early, early going is that uh, over 80% of our members are filling out a detailed health risk assessment in order to give us the data to create a customized experience for them uh, so that we can turn around and let them know what the best options are for them and the trade-offs that are involved in those options. But I think it will take some time because I think the industry as a whole is in that point where what we're doing is taking the analog world and just digitizing it. Um, and so even things like guides and the structure that exists in the applications today for a typical network directory is structured around the 64 different network names and then the subset of doctors and specialists that are under there because it's just literally a translation of the paper book. Whereas in the online world, you need to provide that level of abstraction and usability so uh, that the consumer is exposed to what's relevant to them when it's relevant to them. It would be really the equivalent of Google Maps taking a picture of the United States, a PDF, and giving it to you with 10,000 pins on it and saying, here's the digital equivalent of the map. Whereas what you want is it knows we're here in Columbus Circle and something that puts a usability layer on top of that and then exposes you to the relevant options based off of that context and your individual circumstances. So I think a real opportunity um, and a desire on, and need on, on the part of consumers. Sam, you represent one of the largest health insurance companies in the world. You cover millions, tens of millions of people in various, in various segments of the insurance market. How do you see the, the rise of consumerism? Is, I mean, it's, of course it's there, but how is it going? Sure. Oh, because this is a, such an important issue that we're discussing. Because today, consumers are largely buying on price. So we've had an experience of about 800,000 members who bought on exchange. They were choosing um, their health plans based on affordability. We have to change that discussion to one of value. We have to move the dialogue to one of um, where there's information asymmetry of helping guide consumers, guide patients, guide individuals with information on the care that works for them, the care that is evidence-based, and then use our vast array of data to give consumers information on where, you heard from the last panel, where there are gaps in care, where can, care can be more effective. And in addition, what's so important is we have to use our large data. We have 600 million claims that we derive information from to actually improve health care for all Americans. So today, information asymmetry, buying on price, but consumers are willing in our individual products, in our large national accounts, to accept constrained formularies, constrained networks, as long as they're producing higher quality, safer care. And, and that's been the, the change over the last several years, that willingness to not just have broad networks, but to um, actually um, ask us to invest in helping them bring their costs down. Let's pull up this slide with the consumer survey results. And while that's coming up, David, I know you championed Well, I just want to make clear, we're talking about two different things. Yes, we are. The Affordable Care Act imagined consumerism as competition among insurers. It goes directly to the individual through the exchanges and to some extent through the employers. That's the world we live in today. I'm talking about a completely different world, mm -hmm. where for a significant percentage of consumers, they are direct buyers of their health care. The insurance product isn't covering it through a third party, they're paying for it directly. Correct, and over time they'll realize they're paying for all of it until they get really sick. It's effective catastrophic care. The question I'm asking is, does that significantly change the provider market? Not the insurance market, the provider market. It may change the insurance market, of course. Do doctors and hospitals get more responsive to the consumer because the consumer's and, paying And directly. here's the crucial issue. Everybody's talking about the educated consumer. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Consumers are uneducated, always will be, always should be. The, the way free markets work is those of us who want to sell stuff to consumers have to work really hard to make it simple for them. What we're going to find out, which I think is really important, is whether healthcare is naturally, irreparably complex, or is complex because complexity was a terrific business model for everybody, and now that you've got real customers, it doesn't work so well. So, so let me pick up on, on that point. When, when you think about 
Um, you're right. I don't think we're ever going to get to a point where each and every consumer takes full responsibility for researching, figuring out what's best for them and their families. So we look at it this way. You've got three different entities here, and I think back to Steve's opening comments about we are in a disruptive stage, and you've got an entrepreneur who is disrupting the marketplace in a very positive and significant way. You've got two long-standing uh, blue affiliated organizations, one publicly traded, one uh, not publicly traded. But here's how we look at the whole idea of taking big data and, and garner it, garnering it and using it to change the way providers work and change the way the consumers are led through the process. So here's how it works. First, you have to have the, the, the data. When you think of the, the blues as a whole, 37 blues across the country, uh, 105 million lives that are touched, that's a lot of data. So then you, you, you can garner the data. And we've agreed as a blue group that over the next year, we're going to more than quadruple the data points that we will give to our customers, consumers, and providers, certainly in a HIPAA-compliant way, to, to help make clinical decisions. You need a pipeline. Uh, many of us are part of an organization, for example, called Navinet, which is the portal, physician portal, which originally was to pay claims, to do all those types of business uh, uh, things that we need to do every day. But now they get into actual clinical care, clinical management. So we've got the data, we've got the pipeline, and you need, you need um, a group of practitioners, a group of clinicians who are motivated. So you develop how do you, a system, how do you motivate them? You develop a system of pay for performance. We do it through a company called Tandime Health, where we, with uh, healthcare partners, Davita, have come together to help manage, help physicians manage their practice, give them the real-time data and tools so that they can, by disease state, by population, by individual, better manage care. And if they meet outcome goals, they make more money. And it's, it, it works. So let me give you a practical example. Diabetes. 25 million Americans suffer from diabetes. Uh, uh, estimates are that 25% of Americans, that's 79 million Americans, are undiagnosed but will develop diabetes. Costly chronic disease can be fatal. Well, if we put the data in the hands of the clinician to make decisions to help prevent help people change their life patterns to prevent getting diabetes, significant savings. So, but, does the, but does the physician have the economic incentive? I mean, I know there's risk-sharing models in insurance now where the provider can capture uh, uh, some of the savings if the costs are less than anticipated. But in general, physicians and providers still have an incentive to have a higher volume, to charge more, because that's how they make no, more money. It's, it's that's about why drug companies it. charge more money for Sorry. their drugs, too. It's about shifting it to an outcome system. Yeah. It's about having the data there that shows the outcomes and finishing the data story. So we developed a, a machine-driven algorithm with NYU, the Langone Medical Center, which can really predict people who are predisposed for diabetes. If you, in a matter of seconds, can put that data, put the processes in place in front of a clinician who's dealing with an individual patient on a daily basis, they can begin to prevent people moving towards full-blown diabetes. Cost savings, they win, the patient wins, the system wins. I think, like I think Sam wants to Let's get this slide up with the consumer sure. survey results while, that, while that's happening. If we can pull up that, the poll numbers on, on anonymous data tracking. Okay, great, so go ahead, me, Sam. Me, I'd it. like to present some, some real-world data that I think is compelling. Uh, first, when we look at our healthcare system, there's 30% of what we spend on healthcare today is wasted care, inefficient care, or the wrong care. When you go to your physician or healthcare professional, flip a coin, because that's the likelihood that you're getting care that is evidence-based that meets your needs. Now, let's look at how we spend dollars on health care. One percent of individuals in our commercial book, 30 million, 30 million Americans, one percent drives 28 percent of cost, five drives 57 percent. We've got to get our arms around that. And to Dan's point, the way we're doing that is to move into new models with hospitals, with physician, physicians, and paying for value, actually creating uh, optimal care paths. Uh, rewarding optimal care paths, filling in gaps of care. And that's really the hope of how we're going to make 
care more affordable. Because in many ways, think of this morning's earlier discussion about breakthrough therapies and drugs that cost $125,000 a year. The only way we're going to ever be able to afford them is to take the waste and inefficiency out. And by paying doctors and hospitals differently, today we're at 40%. We're at 40% of our payment is through value-based models. We have to move off a fee-for-service system that rewards units of service to one that rewards outcomes, evidence, and the very best care that we can offer. So one thing that's interesting here, and this, this poll kind of indicates this, is that I was struck by this when we were, we were doing the, the original uh, surveys that PricewaterhouseCooper did, and also I think it's echoed by what our panelists or what our guests here have, have, have voiced, is that costs are so high and the premiums are so high that people are willing to do things that you wouldn't expect them to do. They're willing to wear data trackers. They're willing to actually give up a certain amount of data, even though they don't always have confidence that that data is secure because anything that can help them lower their premiums uh, is something that they're, they're willing to, to make a, a change or, or do something to, to, to address. And, and, and Kevin, I'd be interested in your thoughts on that and, and also on, on the question of how, how, what your experience is. I mean, you are obviously coming into this market, Oscar's coming into this market in the most consumer-driven end of it. What, what are you seeing in terms of what your enrollees are like? Are they different from the typical health insurance enrollees, in both in terms of dem demography, but especially in terms of these kinds of questions? Are they more willing? Are they more engaged? Is there kind of a self-selection going on with your population? Yeah, I think what we're seeing is consistent with the survey results from PricewaterhouseCooperhouse and then what we're seeing here as well. And I think there are two things, which is one, if we make it clear that we're providing value to people and that we're not taking something away and that they don't get penalized uh, with the information if it happens to be, be something negative, that people will engage and give you the information. Um, and we're seeing a couple of spots where it's promising. I mentioned the fact that 80% of our members have filled out a health risk assessment. We gave them $10 to do that right off the bat. Um, as well, we have a bit over 80% of our members have given us access to their information here in New York. There's a regional health information exchange that's got hospital admissions data, a lot of labs, lab data, some prescription data. That comes in for over 80% of our members. And we did something recently here um, with the, the Ebola situation where we incentivized a segment of our population to get a flu shot. And we saw a two and a half time increase for a $20 incentive to get people to go take the flu shot to prevent them from going into the emergency room. And I think you'll see us follow this trend in doing things around devices and others in the next iteration of it uh, because we see that um, people, the cost is high. And it's not just the, the deductible burden of engaging the system that's high, but the premiums are high too as yeah. well, especially in, in this market. And so we're seeing that the activity is very, very consistent, provided we provide value to people and make it clear that it's used to enhance their experience and not to penalize them. And over time, I think one of the challenges we face is how do you do that in an environment that historically has a lot of churn? So if you make these investments, um, but you know, you, 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 even with the best data, the, the value is reaped in year four or five in a market where you have churn on average you know, every three years, um, you know, dollar in, you know, 25 cents back. Um, yeah. How do you think of that? It's a huge problem. Um, Go ahead, Dave. Do you mind if we step back just a little sure. bit? We didn't go from 4% to 17% of GDP on healthcare spending because Americans got a lot less healthy. During the, the, during the 50 years that happened, Americans got a lot healthier. So the increase in spending in healthcare isn't because, oh my God, we're sick and if we can just cure ourselves, it's going to go away. It's a business model issue. It's the way we subsidize and manage demand. And, you know, look, I know this is a bit of motherhood and apple pie, that if we can make people healthier, the, the cost is going to come down. We've done that. People are much we all, healthier. We all got to die of something. We're all going to Well, it's, it's worse than that, right? Uh, we're all going to die of something. But even worse, we are now all going to have a chronic condition. We're all, all going to die of Alzheimer's. A hundred percent of us. And let's, let's look at that famous number about concentration of healthcare spent. Because it tells you all about the way people inside the business are looking at it, right? That sounds very concentrated, right? 10% any year uses 65, 70% of healthcare. It sounds like a lot. Except it's not the same 10% every year. And most of us are going to have our year in that 10%. It's like any expensive good and service that's universally used. In any given year, 6 or 7% of us are going to buy a car. That doesn't mean only 6 or 7% of us own a car. 
And yet we look at healthcare as something so different and so unique and so health-oriented, we're missing the story. The story is we've subsidized all forms of healthcare demand forever. It's a completely undisciplined system. Nobody in healthcare makes money by saving money. Nobody. Because there's no equivalent of a Walmart saying, if I can save money on my inventory, I can lower my prices and drive everyone else out of business. But that's, but that's a just, theory changing. Yeah, but can of, I just uh, dispute one point there? Um, uh, you, you talk about us all buying cars. I would say that the average consumer is much more educated today than they were 10 or 15 years ago. You can I go buy good. a car that is a hybrid, that gets 45 miles to gallon, is in, more environmentally uh, friendly. So there, and you, you, you compare that to healthcare. I disagree. You absolutely can make money by lowering costs. And, and what I mean by that is if you keep a healthier population within a, a corporate, corporate customer or a cadre of, of individuals in a consumer marketplace, and they're paying less for that product, you're going to have more of them. Who's, that, the you, who's the you there? You is, you is the, 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 the insurer and, and the well, like-minded provider, like uh, Thomas Jefferson Health System, uh, University of Pennsylvania Health System, a children's hospital, they understand that if together we keep people healthier and everybody shares in those savings, including what the p consumer pays in premiums. Right. It, it, I, I'm on the other side of that trade. Yeah, I no, run a company that has insured. So last year, our claims rate dropped by 52%. We went to 80% high deductible plans. We have a relatively young workforce. That's what happens, right? Um, our premium quotes dropped around the five, six, seven percent rate. There were only two carriers competing for what I would have thought was terrific business. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, and I think the Affordable Care Act has a lot of this presumption in it that that's how the world works. But in fact, we've now been insured, you know, we've now had employer dominated insurance dominating for 50 years. We haven't seen any of it. We haven't, right? It may be the Cadillac ch tax changes things. But I think without fundamental change to the economics of how it works, look, we've been bundling and unbundling literally for 45 years, right? We've been, oh, if we could just attack this disease, if we can, everybody takes statins now. Far fewer heart attacks. Did it reduce our cost of healthcare? Did not. Significantly reduced uh, risk of strokes. Did it reduce our cost of healthcare? Of course not. And I guess the point I've always made is if you step outside this system and you look at its ability to take money from everything else we do, as long as we're going to continually subsidize all demand, I think, sadly, health is not, and I know, I know I'm the skeptic in the group, and I, I, can, I can live with that. At least it makes the panel more interesting. Uh, <laughs> health That's has, why you're here, Dave. Health has not driven health care cost. And as insiders, we all want to believe it somehow does. Yeah. And for an individual, it definitely does. There appear to be two critical discussions here. One is the financing of health insurance, and then how do you engage the consumer to be a wiser consumer. And the second is, is the delivery system organized and coordinated to get the results that we want? You know, we spend almost 20% of our GDP. That's twice as much as many other nations. <clears throat> and we're stealing. We're really stealing from other infrastructure, from what are called the social determinants of health, from housing, from education. We can't afford this as a nation. But with these two parallels, what's so important is that now delivery systems and health insurers and even certainly informed consumers are coming together and working through that common ground of innovative payment models, of taking waste out of the system, of having better models to prevent rehospitalization, of looking at when generic drugs work best. And that's the, the hope here. Mm -hmm. Because if we just talk about how the insurance system pays, uh, we will not get to the, the real answer, which is a, a highly coordinated system that takes that 30 to 40 percent waste and poor quality care out. Uh, well, let's, let's ask questions or let's do a round for questions and get someone the mic over there. While we're getting him the mic, let me ask this question. One of the underappreciated regulatory changes of the Affordable Care Act that's extremely important is that the law bars in the, in the in market for people who shop for coverage on their own, the law bars the ability of insurers to charge different rates to people based on health status, what's called underwriting. So 
conventionally in an insurance market, if I'm a habitual drunk driver, an auto insurance company can charge my, uh, make my higher, uh, make my auto insurance premiums higher. In health insurance, the equi economically equivalent thing can't be done anymore. It was already effectively illegal in the other insurance markets. Now it's illegal pretty much overall. If it's illegal to charge people different premiums based on their health status, what economic incentive does any American have to live a healthier life knowing their health insurance premium is going to be the same? Yes, I know we all have an incentive to be healthy, but in terms of that powerful economic incentive, that's been taken away. I, I can begin, certainly, and that is that as health insurers, we will be paid differentially based on the burden of illness. So it will become even more important for us to use data analytics to anticipate who will have deterioration health, who is at greatest risk. So there still is an economic model for insurers and delivery systems. As far as individuals, all of us aspire to health. And I believe that that's part of the incentive system that we have. You know, earlier uh, we were talking as our panel was, was, was getting together about what are the incentives for health and wellness. Many large companies, including uh, Anthem today, we have incentives that for uh, a family might be $1,500 where we're paying individuals to get their uh, flu shots, to know their numbers and have uh, cholesterol, blood pressure, and weight managed. Um, and those are, again, early, early uh, approaches to how to um, have people buy into their health. And I think that's what we have to do at the level of employers, to do at the level of communities. We have to do at the level of public health and community health. And as a nation, that's our job together, to make that clear that we can improve the health of our populations. Let's go to this Q&A over here, the question over here. Yes, uh, thank you very much. A great panel. Uh, I'm going to take, a, I'm going to ask, since we have the poobahs here of insurance, <laughs> I'm going to ask this question, which has always bothered me. Uh, why does, don't insurance companies take the, the, the guidelines and the recommendations of the major organizations in every aspect of healthcare who may suggest to you what we should pay for and what we shouldn't pay for? And I'll give you one example. I'm a cardiac surgeon from Harvard. It's a small school up in <coughs> Boston. Uh, and about five years ago, I had a patient referred to me that had had 10 coronary stents placed in one artery of their heart, the left anterior descending. When I operated on the patient, he had one inch left of his LED that I could put a mammary artery to. Now that person who had all that should, that <coughs> doctor that did all that in another state should not have been paid for it in my opinion. Why don't the insurance companies say what should be paid for based on recommendations by bringing all the organizations into the, into the inner sanctum and say, what do you think we should pay for and what do you think we shouldn't pay for? Should we have outcomes-based yeah. uh, uh, payments? Well, what you suggest is exactly what we do. That's what we're doing. Right? We have, if you look at, at all of the certainly large insurance companies, I'm not sure if Oscar can do this yet, we convene the thought leaders of American medicine. We convene specialty societies uh, such as, you know, your uh, Society for Thoracic Surgeons, and we look at the evidence, and that's where we are particularly effective. We cover and guide our members to the very best uh, you know, clinically proven care. We have policies, it's transparent, it's out there. That's what we do on pharmacies, that's what we do on medical care, and it's a powerful uh, model of how we can do better. We work with the specialty society. Some of you may have heard about Choosing Wisely, which is where the medical profession has come together and said, these are five areas within their domains of waste and efficiency, poor care, and we're gonna change this. And they've done that in a partnership with Consumers Union to engage consumers in a way that's understandable to them. But thanks for your point. Dan or Kevin, maybe, you know, just to amplify on that. So Murray uh, Aiken this morning from IMS Health, I thought gave a very provocative presentation where he talked about how there might be ways with uh, drug reimbursement to pay for particular indications where the outcomes were better or just to pay for outcomes in general. This, this patient did well, he had a complete response, let's pay for that and not the guy who basically had no response at all. Is that actually feasible? Can we actually do that, or is that unworkable with the technology? It, and the data it, it is have? feasible if you have a motivated clinician and a, and a motivated health system. If, if, if the incentives are agreed upon and it's all outcome-based, it can be done. It's, it's, it can be done. Kevin, you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I would echo that, and I'd say, why not? Right, that's yeah. the end game. If we're, what all the, the, having the data itself is not useful if we can't make it actionable, and this is a clear example of a win-win-win. But it's getting people on the same page about wanting to do it and identifying 
the actionable data. So now, the I, problem I, is, though, you 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 said earlier, okay, well, we only have these patients for three years yeah. average. What if the outcome is a five-year or ten-year outcome? Then how do you track it longitudinally so that uh, you can actually pay for the right outcome? I, I think in this new consumer world, I think that it is going to be incumbent on us for our business models to retain these customers over a longer term and to think about them over as part of the benefit we provide is to think about them over a life cycle that's not a one year life cycle or two year life cycle but to think about them as 10, 20, 30 year customers for us and with that then I think we can proactively make investments like that that win but it's not they're not all um, 30 year things there's a lot of, of short term things that you can do as well and just identifying basic data around adherence or other things where it just makes sense to send someone to someone's house and, and help them out. Um, even though it may cost a lot and may not be covered, it benefits you over even a six month or one year period. Any other questions out there? Yeah, let's go over here. So I just want to mention something that, that is very important in lowering cost and increasing the value proposition, and that has to do with the provider side. Now, I understand that we're shifting risk over to the provider side, and I believe that that's the right thing to do. Uh, to work with payers and make that happen. 70% of all of the decision making adds to the cost of, um, is in the physician's hands, in the provider's hands. The problem is that when we receive big data to manage our patients, the difficulty is that it's often retrospective and it's often the predictability of claims level data it's only about 80%. So you need to be able to prospectively manage to really cut the costs. Well, you could do some of it, but the challenge is when we hear about big data and we're giving that's our right. providers big data, that's, that's exactly right. only a piece of it, and it's not scalable. So if you say that it's 80% predictive and you're giving us, there's 10% of our patient population, what if you have a million patients? And if you have a million patients, you're gonna take 10% of them and try to manage them with care management it's not scalable. So it's a very difficult challenge when we're shifting risk to providers, and I want people to appreciate that big data is great, but it has to be actionable and scalable yeah. and useful and timely. We, we couldn't agree more, and that was the example I was trying to give around diabetes, where just from claims data and pharmacy data, you can, you can tell not only a story about the past, but you can predict the future. And if, if, if certain patients who are somewhere on the spectrum, either pre-diabetic or could become pre-diabetic, then the physician can influence, if you have a willing patient, can influence the behaviors, uh, the therapies that that, that that patient takes. So you, you have that past data. Big data is a scary thing. But you need to cull it down and be able to tell, predict a story in the future. And that's where, that's where the, the, the provider can make a difference. David? I mean, I think the, the pre-diabetes example is a, is a great one, but probably for different reasons. Um, <laughs> I, I would suspect the percentage of people in this room who don't know the risks for diabetes uh, in behavior is somewhere around 0%. Uh, in my overweight, under-exercising, bad diet employees, they all know, right? Our expectation that this is a problem going to be solved by the healthcare system until we invent a cure for diabetes, is an unrealistic one, right? We love the idea of a clinician coming in and saying you should exercise more and eat less, but guess what? Your best friend said it also, and your best friend's more credible. Yeah, but I would suggest, David, that if, if you as the employer uh, were incentivized by lower premiums, if you helped your... So that's, yeah, that's, I, I, that's I, I, let I me tell you as an real, employer how it works. As it works as an employer, your approach to health insurance is, I need health insurance to keep people from quitting. Because right. the guys across the street give health insurance. I'm not in the health business. I'm in the game show business, and I'm barely any good at that. <laughs> right? So I have absolutely no time whatsoever. The problem is, when people talk to employers, well, they What's talk the to, highest rated game show on the game show network Thank right you now. for asking. Well done, Ovik. Uh, I would recommend seeing The Chase or Skin Wars. Uh, but Idiot <laughs> Test is terrific, too. <laughs> and in fact, if I can suggest changing the subject to this panel, right. uh, but, but let, me, let, me just, uh, let me tell you how I think as an employer, right? I don't want to be in the health business of my employees. I'm not GE with 1,000 people in HR. I've got four, right? Here's what I want to do. I want my employees not to be irritated at me. So when one employee came to me screaming that our insurer wouldn't pay for her second lap band surgery, I'm on her side. My job isn't to change her life. Mm -hmm. She's a talented, valuable employee. My job is to keep her. 
And part of the reason we waste so much money and spend so much money in healthcare is we have this completely unrealistic expectation of what healthcare is. We're not going to solve diabetes until someone comes up with a cure or until people want to live differently. And the idea that the healthcare system should be paid on an outcome basis, I guarantee you where this is going, right? Yeah. Which is any improvement will increase the cost of care. And we're going to pay for it. And that's what we, look, we've been doing this for 40 or 50 years. There's nothing new in, gee, if people were just healthier, it'd be cheaper. Nothing new in that right. idea. But David, so, David, I would say we're missing, this is real quick, I apologize. Uh, I would say that the missing ingredient in this discussion is the, the senior benefit executive from a large national company. They, those folks are pushing innovation, and they are creating the same type of stickiness that you have to create for your members, but they're doing it in a way that they're having people comply to uh, certain protocols, comply with certain regimen. That, that they're not allowed to do that. That's against no, no, the law. No, no. They, David, what, I, what I mean, what I mean is they're incentivizing that. them to do it because they're making it easy to them. People are already incentivized to avoid diabetes. Uh, they really are, right? A few hundred they, dollars they, is not the incentive. They're, they're, when I see that pizza, they, I feel a lot less incentive. So do I. I There's a reality those... here, though, for employers. David, to say that employers are not particularly interested in health insurance costs and do, want to do something about it, the average family over the last decade has a, in, an income of $50,000. Health care costs have doubled to be about $25,000. That's $10,000 in lost wages. That can't continue, wages. right? At some point, so, people, are, and this is already happening, if you look at the polls, and Gallup just put out a poll the other day about this, people are foregoing a lot of the care, whether you think it's so, necessary so, or not, so we have, because they're paying that deductible but, but we and have, they're paying for but it. But we have economic stagnation in part because of health care costs. And diabetes is the perfect, the perfect model because 50, 60 percent of individuals with diabetes can have their disease reversed, any of us by exercise and diet, preventing all of the long-term complications. So there's strong motivation. So I, I only say that because I think it is absolutely, healthcare costs have, have created a, a large part of our economic problem for government programs and for private Let's so try to get payers. one question. We got, we got a lot of hands up there. Let's go way up to the peanut gallery. Um, so, so I think there's a, there's a question coming. There's a huge, huge assumption in the case that you're making. Um, um, Mr. Hilferty, you mentioned diabetes. Let me just take that example. So you have 100 million patients, say, a lot of data. You have now ways to give it to the physicians. And we think that that's going to translate into savings and all of the amazing things. No. The way that we experience an interaction with a physician, with a nurse, with my insurer, which happens to be a blue, is horrible. It comes in a language that I don't speak. Imagine buying something on Amazon where the box is the most, the cheapest possible cardboard. It comes in Swahili. They send you nine different invoices. One for the box, one for the speaker, one for the battery. Later on they say, this is not an invoice, don't pay this one. We, we got, we got 50 material. seconds, so let me, let me stop so you the there. And is, let me I ask think, the question. The question okay. is, why have the payers not understood that they need to design the experience for people and the last step, which is when we engage directly to you or through our providers, because everything else before is not going to have an effect if to we don't to do to something Totally get it. Behavior. So, Kevin, let me go to you, because this is exactly what you're focusing this, your entire this company is, around. This is the premise why we started it, right? Because we felt that the consumer was an afterthought in the process, and that, like you said, they got the residual of a transaction-based system where you got a... a what thing that came and said, what, what really prompted us to start this is we got this thing that said, here's an explanation of benefits, and it was everything but an explanation, mm -hmm. right? Underneath, Great. that was the one thing it wasn't. And we said, wait a Great. second, how could this be so confusing? And, and what, what happens is that, uh, unlike this beautiful venue here in Columbus Circle, a typical experience for consumers, like going to Times Square, all these things pop out at you, right? And are different colors and flashing and require you to put in all this information, so the consumer just shuts off. And it was with that premise that we started and said, if you put this usability layer on top, it's a start to get this engagement. But I, I you know, uh, would disagree also with, with the nice gentleman here in saying that I think that you know, you could, we could put our hands up and say it's been like this for 30 years and people haven't engaged. But that's looking back when what we've offered to people is you know, in black and white in a world that's broadcasting in color. And we're wondering, well, hey, people have flipped the channel before, so now they're going to keep flipping the channel and go past this now. Well, what if we broadcast in color? Maybe they'll stick and tune into our show, too. It's not know? technology. So, it's so who the customer is. It's just who the customers. We've never been the customer. And if we are, 
you'll have to talk to us in a simple language. I'm going to give you but one the, sentence, Dan, because we're running over. Two sentences. The okay. key point is that you, what you said, it's the interaction with the physician. What, we're, what we need to do is give the physician the tools that they have in a simple, direct way so that they can have the human interaction with you as a patient. And you're right. The industry, health systems, collectively, we've done a bad job, whether it's looking at your bill or how we communicate health care. So it's about freeing the physician, freeing the clinician for all that so they can have that human interaction. And someone in, on their office staff can help you work your way through a very complex system. Well, let's let's hope that as the Four consumer is, is, is <laughs> let's hope that as the consumer gets more in charge of the system, that these tools will orient around the consumer more and have to be more user friendly because the consumer is going to be making the decision, which in an often case they're not making that decision today. So, thanks everybody. I appreciate Thank the you. time. Very interesting discussion.